Well, listening to the Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and today we're going to talk about the final topic in rigid body Newtonian kinetics, which is general plane motion. We talked about translation, we've talked about fixed axis rotation in previous videos, and both of those cases essentially had restrictions on our general equations. Now that we're in general plane motion, all restrictions are lifted. And so we're left with the equations sum of forces in the x as a vector is equal to our mass times the acceleration of our centroid, so a bar as our vector, that's going to be in the x direction, and then sum of forces in the y direction is equal to our mass times our centroidal acceleration, a bar sub y. Okay, there's two of our three equations. The third equation, of course, is our moment equation, sum of moments. We have an option in this equation either to sum them about the centroid, so that's gonna be my first version of the equation, point g, and that's going to equal my moment of inertia about the same centroid, writing that as I bar, times our angular acceleration alpha. Or if we choose some point that isn't our centroid, we can write this as the sum of our moments about some other point, let's call it point P. This is going to equal my I bar alpha. I still need those terms, but I get to add in my kinetic moment. The kinetic moment is R of my centroid relative to my chosen point crossed with my mass of the body times acceleration of the centroid as a vector. Now, if you have multiple components of this acceleration, I'm gonna squeeze in a little summation out front, just relating to the fact that there are times you can have two kinetic moment terms, just depending on where you pick the location of this point P and also which axis system you use. Those two things kind of interact. So just a couple of points just to hammer home here on general plane motion. If we have a system, so point one here, I'll draw a diagram and then I'll fill in some words. And so if we have a system, say a fixed axis rotation wheel, and let's say that we're given some forces and things going on, but we need to solve for its acceleration. And we'd like to assume, or we think that the acceleration of the top part of this no-slip wheel is gonna go to the right. So if I say this is A sub T, I better make sure that my alpha and that linear acceleration a sub t quote move together okay that they agree with one another we wouldn't want to draw an unknown alpha in this direction that could break the problem okay so this is one of those cases that if you um, don't make these two agree with each other then you can have some issues in getting correct answers now if you wanted to assume that things are going to the left, so your tangential acceleration of that top point going left, then go ahead and use this alpha that's positive from the right-hand rule. Okay, so either one of these is fine. We just can't have our linear accelerations and our angular accelerations in disagreement. They need to be harmonious. They need to be working together. And so to put this into words, we can say that always make sure our tangential acceleration vectors and our alpha vectors agree with each other. And one other point to make as we work these problems, keep in mind that coordinate systems are a tool to solve problems, okay? So you're welcome to use, honestly, infinitely different coordinate systems. Often we pick a Cartesian horizontal X vertical Y, but we want to pick a coordinate system which minimizes two different things. The first thing we want to minimize is our force components. And so this is what we tend to do in statics. As we take a look at a problem, we take a look at the different forces, we think, hey, if I go ahead and rotate my coordinate system, I can get rid of some of the components of these various forces and often kind of count the number of forces aligned with one coordinate system versus the other and see where things balanced. But keep in mind that in dynamics now, we also have that right side of the equation, all those acceleration terms. So we also need to think about minimizing our acceleration. 
components. And to be quite honest, all things being equal, we tend to be a little more comfortable with our force components than our acceleration components. And so I tend to go with minimizing my acceleration components in my computations. They'll, they'll both give you the correct answers overall. You're going to get the exact same values, but just thinking about where that work is going to show up, thinking about acceleration components and minimizing, we can actually take a look back up here, this summation sign out front, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you only had one of these acceleration components versus multiple? Also looking in our sum of force equations, if we can isolate all of our motion and it's linear motion in one single direction, then one of these accelerations, either AX or AY, could go to zero. Say, so say you draw your axis system with all of your acceleration, linear acceleration, going the X direction, then this becomes zero and you get sum of forces equal to zero, right? Which is more of a static style equation. So we like that. So it's really up to you whether you're diminishing work over on the left side of your equation or on the right side of your equation. But that's essentially what it's talking about here. Uh, minimizing your force components versus minimizing your acceleration components. So that's all the, really the fundamental notes there are on this topic. Let's go ahead and jump into the first example. So this first example that we have, we have a spool, and the spool is going to be suspended by a cord from a rope. You can think this is going to be analogous to a yo-yo. Okay, we've got a cord up here. Now we're not raising and lowering our hand. We're saying this cord is attached to a non-moving point. And this is a compound spool, so there's actually kind of a, a stepped um, size to it. And we have an additional cable pulling up here with 70 newtons pulling up vertically. Now, the dimensions of this spool, we have an inner diameter to the first segment of 0 0.2 meters, and then an outer diameter out here to the outside edge of 0 0.5 meters. Okay, so 0.2 meters on the inside, 0.5 meters on the outside. And so the text of this problem says that we have a 8 kilogram spool. And the spool has a known K sub G of 0 0.35 meters. And do you remember what K sub G means? A distance. This is our radius of gyration. And on a good number of rigid body problems, if you have kind of a complex shape, a shape that isn't listed on one of the standard tables, if we list the radius of gyration, we can actually combine that with the mass to then back compute the mass moment of inertia. Keeping in mind here that our I bar is equal to m times k sub g squared because we also knew that k sub g was equal to the square root of our i bar over the mass so jumping back over the problem statement we have this eight kilogram spool is pulled upwards by a 70 Newton force. We want to find the cable tension and the angular acceleration alpha. All right, so to get a little bit more into depth on this problem, one thing we can observe is that this contact point right here, this is going to be the ICZV of this body. Just like other pulley systems, if we have a cable that's not moving at the top and it's not stretching at this instant, it's also not moving at the bottom. Now everything else in this system would be moving. One thing we need to get into in this problem is figure out whether it's spooling up the cable or coming down the cable. Uh, in order to think about that, let's take a look at a combined free body diagram plus kinetic diagram. And we can get away with combining those because we have a single body problem. This is single body in general plane motion. So we have a tension pulling over here on the right hand side. That's that tension, cable tension that we're going to be solving for. We also have the weight force. This is a vertical system. And so we have 8 kilograms times 9.81. So 
times 9.81, our gravitational constant, this is going to equal 78.48 newtons. And then we had a 70 newton force, which is pulling upward, and it's pulling upward on that 0.2 meter radius. Now, before we get into our kinetic terms, let's ask ourselves the question, is alpha positive or negative? And of course, this is always going to be from the right hand rule. Okay, so positive would mean that it was spooling down that cord, dropping downwards. Negative would mean that it's coming up the cord. So go ahead and take a look at the forces, take a look at the distances, and see if you can determine is alpha positive or negative. Go ahead and pause the video. All right, so coming back to answer that question, keep in mind we have a 70 newton force pulling upwards, 78.48 pulling downwards. If you only looked at those two forces, you may think that the 78 newton force is gonna dominate and it's gonna roll down this cord. But the two things you haven't included, if you thought that, is that we haven't found the value of this tension. This value of this tension, if it's anything bigger than about nine, is going to essentially give us upward forces, upward, upward net forces. The other thing to think about is the moments of each one of these forces. We talked about that there's an ICZV over here acting like an instantaneous point of fixed axis rotation. And so really it's going to be the distance over to each one of these forces, a distance here and a distance there, multiplied with the force. And so we can write that out and we can say that the sum of moments about point A and the values of each one of these, we have 70 newtons, and that is going upwards, a distance of 0.7 meters, 0.5 plus 0.2. And basically, we want to compare that to our 78.48 newtons multiplied times 0.5. And so it turns out that the one here on the left is going to equal 49 newton meters. The one on the right equals 39.24 newton meters. So therefore, the moment of the 70 newton dominates, and we end up with a negative right-hand rule because the moment from the 70 newtons is larger. And then getting back to that topic of making sure that our alphas are in agreement with our accelerations, when we look at the centroidal acceleration here, A bar sub Y, we want to draw that upwards because if alpha is basically spooling this wheel going up the cable, then the acceleration of the centroid will also go up. One more um, step to get us started in this equation before we jump into our Newtonian equations is again here to find our I bar. I roughed out this equation above. So I bar is equal to the mass times the radius of gyration about the centroid squared. And so we have eight kilograms and our distance is 0.35 squared, that's in um, meters squared. And so this will equal 0.98, and this will be in kilograms, mass times length squared, meters squared. Okay, so there's our I bar term. Now, in solving for this problem, we have two options, two fundamental options. We can either sum our moments about the centroid, point G, or we can sum our moments about this contact point over here, point A. I'll show you both just to see what the difference is between those two. So I'll keep my free body diagram visible there. So first of all, let's go ahead and sum moments about G. So summing moments about G, because that's our centroid, we can say that the sum of moments as a vector about the centroid G is equal to just I bar times alpha. We don't need to add in the kinetic moment term. And so now looking at 
these this free body diagram we can ignore the effect of this weight force because it's actually traveling right through point g we'll only have two terms here a moment from the 70 newtons and a moment from our unknown tension so from the 70 newtons we have an r vector going from g over to this line of action going upwards so that'll be negative from the right hand rule so we have a negative 0 0.2 times 70 newtons and then we additionally have a 0.5, this is meters, over to our unknown force T. And so that's all of our moments. And this is going to be equal to our mass moment inertia, 0.98, and that multiplied times our alpha. Now this alpha again, the sign needs to come from our free body and kinetic diagram. And we can see this alpha is negative from the right-hand rule. Wrapping your fingertips in the direction of this arrow tip, your thumb should go into the screen. And so we need to write this as a negative alpha to make sure that everything all works together. And then we can do our second equation, sum of forces, in this case, all the forces are in the y direction, equals mass times a bar sub y. Now with this equation, we have three forces in the y direction. Let's keep that free body diagram visible. We have our tension force, which is going up. We have our 70 newtons, which is going up. And then we have our 78.48, which is going downward, so negative. And this is going to equal uh, the value of the mass, which is 8 times the acceleration of my centroid in the y direction. Now, as you look at these equations, it might look a little, uh, a little scary that we have three unknowns. We have t, we have alpha, we have a sub y. Okay, three different un unknowns and two equations. Now, if you sum your forces in the x direction, it doesn't tell you anything. But because we know that point A is an ICZV, we have one more equation that we can add to the mix. And that equation is that the acceleration of the centroid in the y direction is going to be equal to the distance of R of G relative to A times my alpha. Now this comes from the cross product, I can write this in the vector version, um, acceleration bar vector in the y direction is equal to alpha cross this R of G relative to A. Okay, so I'm thinking about that as a scalar term. The reason I can think about it as a scalar term is I already know from my diagram that I am assuming that the acceleration of the centroid is going upwards. Okay, so I'm going to stick with that. And basically, we're going to end up with a positive value for A sub Y. But I can come in and say, well, A bar is actually equal to the distance of 0 0.5 times alpha. And what that does is it gets me down to a two equation, two unknown set, getting rid of A bar. So solving that two equation, two unknown set, by whatever method you choose, substitution, cancellation, whatever works for you, we find that alpha is equal to 3.28, that's in radians per second squared, and our tension is equal to 21.58, and that is in newtons. So there's our answers for alpha and T. Now, I mentioned that we could look at this one other way, and the other way we could look at it, instead of summing moments about our centroid, let's go ahead and sum moments about point A. Okay, so summing moments about point A, the only moments I'll have are gonna be due to the weight force and this vertical force here of 70 Newtons. So for convenience, I went ahead and moved a copy of my free body diagram down here lower on the page as we are going to sum our moments about point A. So as we work to sum our moments about point A, summing moments about point A as a vector, it's a non-centroidal point. Now, it is not a point of fixed axis rotation. So being not a point of fixed axis rotation, we can't shift our moment of inertia over to that location. We do need to use the kinetic moment is the safer way to go. And so we have I alpha plus my kinetic moment term which is my R of G relative to A as a vector crossed into my mass times my acceleration of the centroid as a vector. Now, there is only one acceleration of the centroid. In this case, we've isolated all that in the Y direction, so that's convenient. We don't have to worry about one of those. We don't have to worry about a summation. And we can also draw here our vector. So this is my r of g relative to a it has a distance of 0.5 meters and it's going from right to left 
So putting values in for this version of the equation, distance once again of 0.5 also shows up my moment equation. So 0 0.5 meters times the weight of 78.48. That's in newtons. That one is positive from the right-hand rule as we cross this blue R into this red force coming downward. And then we also have from A over to the line of action of the 70. So that distance is 0 0.7 meters times the force of 70 newtons. And that one is going to have a negative sign from the right-hand rule. So that takes care of everything on the left-hand side of the equation. On the right side of the equation, I'm going to, have to drop down to the next line, so I have plenty of room. We have our mass moment inertia by the centroid, 0.98. That was in kilogram meter squared. And then we have our unknown alpha. And as we take a look at our kinetic moment term, we are going to cross this blue vector, my r vector, into our acceleration vector of the centroid, which is going upwards. Okay, so the blue into the purple gives me a negative kinetic moment. So we end up with a negative. The value here being the length of 0 0.5 times the mass again is eight kilograms. And then we have our acceleration of the centroid, A bar sub y. All right, now I could go ahead and sum my forces in the y direction, I'd actually end up with the exact same equation I did previously, noticing that we have two unknowns, but that's not really the equation I need to get rid of one of these unknowns. The one that I need to get rid of the unknowns is actually written right up here, the same one we used before. So we can do a substitution here again that our centroidal acceleration is equal to 0 0.5 meters times alpha. Now we get down to one unknown in this equation. And so from this equation, we can find that our alpha is equal to 3.28 radians per second squared. The exact same value we had in the previous iteration. And you could add in, once again, it's going to be the exact same sum of force equation as we had in the previous version to then go ahead and solve for the tension. So hopefully that's helpful to see the same problem solved in a couple of different ways, essentially just by shifting the point we're summing our moments about. When we chose to sum our moments here about point G, we, in this problem, ended up with the exact same number of terms on the left-hand side of our equation. If we sum our moments about point A, we had to add in the kinetic moment term, but the added benefit there is that we're able to actually solve for alpha from this equation, as opposed to needing the equation for summing forces in the y direction. Okay, so there's a couple different paths, both getting you to the same point. I hope this helped conceptualize this topic. I'll do one more example in a later video, but I hope you're having a great day. Thank you.